<laughs> oh, I'd like to uh, welcome Bob to give us our first keynote. Bob and Jenny have both been visiting us all week and we've had really productive discussions and it's been a great week from the department's point of view in terms of really thinking about ideas of policies and practice in higher education research. So it's a great pleasure to ask Bob to come and give us our first keynote this morning. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Paul, uh, for the invitation to speak and the invitation to Lancaster. It's been fantastic. And I think from my experience this week, we have a great department of um, educational research. So I'm a very mature man, and I get my chance now. Um, <laughs> uh, Paul asked me to talk about that topic, which I suppose is how the global and policies at that level impact universities. Um, and I want to sort of complexify that and destabilise it a little, and I'll talk perhaps more about this, because I think today universities, higher education systems, and indeed policies are located in multiple geographies, multiple spatialities, and I think thinking about the global to the institution is one way to think about those uh, relationships, but I think there's other and multiple ways, and I want to talk about um, those things. This is an Australian cartoon. Uh, it's picking up on, I suppose, the homogenizing impact of globalization. But of course, there's heterogenizing, hybridizing uh, impacts as well, globalizing, localizing, um, and so on. Um, just makes me feel better when I put those books up. And the one on the right, you need a mortgage to take out. Uh, you need to take out a mortgage to buy it. So the what I want to do in the first part is attempt to define policy, and I'll offer a range of definitions because I think often policy research and talk about policy takes for granted what policy is, i.e. a text. And I want to talk about that, um, and then I'll go on to talk about the multiple spatialities that higher education systems, universities and policy are now located in. But just a few opening remarks. Um, Margitson has said that the modern university, this sort of university, is a creature of the nation state. That's true, but my argument's going to be that the nation state has also been rescaled and there's other um, processes and relationships of policy that are going on. That modern definition, of course, is linked to modernity and those features that we're rational, uh, the world is understandable and the application of our rational thought, and that's a particular Western construction of modernity universally uh, applied. And, of course, there's some uh, challenges uh, from the post to that sort of universality. It's interesting, Marginson, in a paper he's done in a handbook I've just edited, argues, and I think all of you would argue, that there are three trends in higher education globally. Higher participation, that move from elite to mass, perhaps to universal, to use Trow's definitions. The second one's one I'll pick up more in this talk, the spread of research capacity, the sort of empty signifier of a world-class university. We all want to be a world-class university now. Um, I have a student from Sultan Kubos in Oman. Their university strategic plan is to be number three in their region and be a world-class university. It's a, almost an empty signifier that uh, circulates. But I think the other bit of it, the one world science system, metrics, bibliometrics, university rankings, Shanghai, Jiang Tao, I think all of us in some way in our institutions and higher ed systems are pulled into that and the introduction of quasi-business organisations. And one way to think about this is through globalised discourses which, which uh, circulate, hyper-narrative, the flows of ideas, policy scapes, global education policy. Interestingly, in a recent paper that Stephen Ball's done where he reprises some of his earlier work, he says that most policy research simply deals with text whereas his was, he was always interested in the discourses that framed it. And I think that, that's interesting. Fazel and I, in a book we wrote, we made this distinction, which I now wouldn't hold to, and it's basically what the second part of this talk will be about, the distinction between space and place, space being here, uh, the material, and place being the much more abstract. But, of course, the global and the processes of globalisation overcome that. Um, and people have written about that in various ways. I think Harvey's interesting in terms of different uh, space-time uh, relationships that we're located in. So in the way the, the first title I had up was seeing place as the local, 
and, and space as, uh, as the global and a master narrative which impi- impacts in that way. Like much globalization research is focused on how the national has mediated the global. In either case, the emphasis is on the global and the national, with the latter conceptualized implicitly as a place influenced by outside forces. Peck talks about globalization being the context of context. And my argument is, and I'll try to pr- pursue this more as a provocation than a a fully formed argument that we need to move beyond the binary to think about um, universities and how policy impacts higher ed systems and how policy impacts how they're located in you know, EU uh, and there's other international organisations. We need to move beyond the binary of place, space, local, global, national, international to understand the multiple geographies of power and policy within which individual universities and systems are located. And I think that's particularly the case in respect of that text discourse. It might be, might be, I don't know, that if you look at text, maybe they are national, and then there's local text. The discourses might be more global, but I don't think there's a crude binary in that way. OK, just come to some quick definitions of policy. An old, old and famous one is the authoritative allocation of values. In our book, we argued each element had been destabilised. Authority, legitimate right to exercise power, had been, there's authority now, EU authority, the authority for uh, developing nations of uh, the World Bank, for example. The allocation processes with inside a nation, state processes, they've been restructured under new public management and network governance, and the values, discourses, ideologies, of course, are now globalised as well, but in some ways have been replaced by numbers, and I'll come to that. And there's the observation by Ball at the bottom, which I think uh, picks up on what I'm going to try to say in the second part of the talk, um, that we, if we're looking at policy, yes, we can look inside the nation, but because of network governance, we've got to look to other players, businesses, edgy business, phil- uh, philanthropic arms and so on, We've got to look regionally, nationally, and to business there, um, civil society actors, um, and so on. So one definition of policy. Um, Policy is always an interplay of facts, norms, and desired actions. Uh, We can see it here. So I I think we can never have evidence-based policy, and we know it never is anyway, but there's always the discourse or the ideology there. It's a mix, a coming together, a meld of multiple of multiple things. The second definition is that policies processes as well, what happens before the text is produced and when it goes out into practice and then into implementation or enactment. Picked up on in the last statement, it's words and deeds, what is enacted and what is intended, and they're not the same things always. Um, Luke and Hogan, interesting definition. Jenny Osger, and, and I think maybe this, and, and we use this in a piece we wrote together as well, we were arguing if a minister made a speech and people jumped and changed, well, that's the sort of policy. It has a policy effect, but um, interesting. Uh, Ball, in the most recent book, now it's on schools, and he makes that distinction between policy as text, then in to practice as a mode of translation. But he also picks up on policy as discourse, which constructs people, like in a Foucauldian way, the last point there, as subjects in a way, um, and framing up what we speak and say. And, and I think that text discourse, and he's argued in the 2015 paper that most policy research either doesn't define policy or deals with the text. Policy always constructs the problem to which it's the putative solution, the problem of the problem. And then as I suggested a moment ago, I think the most recent um, implementation research tends to talk about enactment. That was that old work on street level bureaucrats. But I think it depends on how much space you have in practice, depends on the nature of the policy. And sometimes there's uh, a funding compliance trade-off, different sorts of policies, material, symbolic, and so on. But, it's, but policy enactments, so if we're looking, say, at policy in uh, England and HE, uh, the enactments uh, go on within existing uh, structures. They don't occur on a ex nihilo, uh, they're not ex nihilo, on a tabula rasa. And the, the site of practice, as he suggests in, they suggest in relation to schools, there are a number of contextual uh, dimensions that mediate the enactment of policy, policy into practice the context, situated professional cultures, material context, and the broader uh, context in which the institution 
uh, is located. Ball, of course, a long time ago talked about policy cycles rather than linear and the way that pressures to produce policy into practice, then out and managing, and this goes on in multiple ways, and that's located now in multiple uh, spatialities. And once again, I repeat uh, that Ball comment there. I think most recently, and I've alluded to this, um, Mary's written about it uh, in her uh, book, Literacy and the Politics of Representation, a chapter there on literacy as numbers. But I think this is, is, is a very important aspect of understanding policy today. And we know that the etymology of statistics is state numbers. But I think with our computational capacities, uh, the whole move to accountabilities, audit cultures, evaluative states, uh, numbers and data have become more important. New public management re relationships between those who produce the policy and those who put them into practice are structured around numbers. And the last quote from Jenny Osger about data production and management are central in this structure and are central elements of what policy is. Now, I haven't got time to talk about uh, all of this here, but I think that the, the point is that, in a way, numbers techni technicise and depoliticise politics, but they're also inscription devices helping to create that of which they talk. Another way of thinking of policy is to use Foucault's notion of dispositif, which brings text, discourses, architecture, the materiality all together. And I think that Bailey, in a paper in the Journal of Ed Policy recently, I, I think this is an interesting dual way to think of policy as an idea and a material and governable field of practices, technologies of governance, policy as technologies of governance. And I think numbers uh, work well in that way. OK, to come to then the multiple spatialities, I want to talk about these things very quickly. Um, the common world education culture, the work of John Meyer and his colleagues from the 70s at Stanford, um, the globalised localisms, localised globalisms argument of um, Boa Ventura de Santos, the rescaling argument, the topological turn, network governance and the idea of a global education policy field. So if we uh, come to the first, Basically, this argument, now this argument was put well before the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, and our current version of globalisation. But they still hold to this argument that, that um, and it's the sort of imposition of a particular modernity, a particular set of values, Western, as uh, a set of world polity uh, cultural norms. They argue that there are universal models of education, state and society, world models. Uh, Dale calls this the common world education culture approach. And it's out of that, they argue, that there's policy convergence. That is, nations across the globe, uh, their institutions, their state structure, their universities, their schools, all tend to look alike and aren't as responsive to the needs of the uh, local um, and the national. And of course, this is linked to a particular construction of modernity. And that's been challenged by the multiple modernities argument and the argument about multiple epistemologies of uh, uh, the Southern theory that Connell's written about, the need to de-parochialise uh, Western, Northern epistemologies, uh, and so on. Against that, Dale argues that uh, there's what he calls the GSAE, he loves all of these acronyms, uh, a globally structured agenda for education. And he argues what's happening in policy terms affecting systems of higher ed, he would, and universities is the political economy of globalisation. What's happened globally and the argument as we've gone to a more open, uh, more towards free trade, anti-tariff uh, global economy following the end of the Cold War, um, that that has seen a constitution within nations of education as human capital as the major economic policy that nations can control. So that's, that's one argument. Um, it's interesting, I've always been very critical of it. It seems very apolitical to me and hasn't really changed as the world has changed. But some research we've done, um, I found some essences of some of that. Uh, and I'll come back to it. So this is an argument about the isomorphism of the central institutions of nations across the globe. 
This is a very different argument and one that I find quite attractive. Uh, the Portuguese sociologist, he argues that there are multiple globalizations and what's usually spoken of as globalization is that supported by particular <coughs> power holders within the most powerful nations, the G7. And this is Bourdieu's argument about globalization can be used in a performative way to define, like if, if you listen to Australian politicians, when they talk about globalization, they're talking about neoliberalism basically. But there's a sort of pushing across the two. Um, De Sousa Santos um, argues that what we see as globalized discourses are really localized discourses from powerful places which become globalized. Right? So, for example, English is a uh, globalised localism. Or, uh, or Salberg's notion of germ, I always think it should be germs with a plural, uh, global education reform movement, uh, that's a globalised localism. It's an Anglo-American model of school reform, which is across the globe. And then he says when that hits a particular nation, what you get is a localised globalism. Um, and they play out in particular ways. Now, in terms of policy as numbers, I think if you look at the Shanghai Jiangtong ranking, it's interesting, I think. And there's a great paper by Odorico and Lloyd in a recent uh, journal of education policy where they talk about, like, it was China that started this because China had a national plan to have um, world-class universities. And what they wanted to do was compare what their universities were doing with what particularly those in the US were doing. And so they created this ranking. But of course, the criteria in the ranking, um, the, the criteria in the ranking, that, that's what goes into it. You can see it's how many alumni have got Nobel Prizes and field medals, how many current staff have, um, how many high sight people you have. I did a review of a, a faculty at the University of Adelaide recently, and we met with the Vice Chancellor beforehand, and he told us that part of his strategy to reposition Adelaide in the top 100 in the world, that he had this big bundle of money aside to employ high citation individuals from around the world. I thought, my God, um, is this the world I'm now in? But you can see how this is sort of um, positioning. And just, uh, just to, um, so by classifying institutions on the basis of a narrow set of criteria, the rankings reward those that most closely resemble the ideal model of higher education. And they talk about harvard you know, that, so And, and that's a globalised localism. It's a particular model of a particular university which becomes what everybody then uh, measures themselves as, which then becomes a localised globalism. Like Melbourne University at one stage in Australia used to advertise as the Harvard of the Pacific. I mean, a good example of... Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> the rescaling argument, and Neil Brenner has written interestingly about this, I think, and he argues that statehood's been rescaled. So there's relationships, say, between the UK and the EU, but also all those international organisations, WTO, etc. So that the nation state. Um, it's not merely national, but networked um, with others. Of course, this still takes the, the geopolitical unit of the nation and other geopolitical units and organisations is what we look at. But there has been this move from the national to the post-national. And how do we think about those relationships? Well, Dale, and he's working trying to update this argument, but he argued that the way uh, through rescaling of statehood, the way... Uh, some sort of convergence was occurring in policy terms. And you can think about this with inside nations. It's through imposition, examples there, harmonisation, dissemination, uh, standardisation, and installing of interdependence. And you could see how they work, say the Bologna process. I always remember when I was at the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh did not change its undergraduate, their undergraduate's degrees of four years. Um, and the Vice-Chancellor said, we're not changing to fit in with Bologna. Um, I was always intrigued by that in a way, um, when all my friends in continental European universities were complaining endlessly about restructuring their degrees to fit in with the model. But that's interesting because there's power and other matters that come, uh, come to play and so on. But you could think about how each of these work, and they work differently, of course. Um, 
that, that uh, imposition, of course, those structural adjustments, say, from the World Bank to schooling systems um, and so on. I always love this notion. I did some research with Martin Lorne um, earlier this century, and uh, we were looking at the way OECD work affected different nations in Europe. Um, and when we interviewed people in Portugal, they used a Portuguese phrase, which we translated as that, the magistrature of influence. And they argued that there was all this documentation, reviews, numbers, metrics, and everything they were doing in Portugal was to change their collection of statistics, their collection of this, their that, to line up with that. And it was almost as if this was great, um, which is interesting. Um, interesting, I think. So to come to the topological, and I find this, this really, really interesting, um, and there's a, a great a special number of theory, culture, and society on this, uh, edited by Lurie and others. I suppose usually we think of relationships as positioned in space, if we're looking at, at space, that something's here, something's here, and there's a relationship. But I suppose if you look at the underground map in London, the map is relational rather than representational in a sense. And I think that's the way the topological, you know, there's some, some sculptural pieces, you could twist them in any way, and they remain part of a whole still, but their interconnections work in different ways. And I think topology, as Lurie says, it's all this ordering, modelling, networking, metrics, measuring, uh, league tables, mapping that constitute culture, technology and science in a sort of post-Euclidean way. That is that um, what matters in this is not location but relation. And so um, you, you can have something in an international organisation di linking directly to someone in your department or school or university. It's, they're different sets of relationships. It's not something out there and there. It's this relation. And, of course, with the new computational capacities and digital capacities, that works in different ways. And the interesting thing is the way Amin um, argues that we can think of globalisation in this topological way. And I think initially this spatial stuff in globalisation was a sort of rescaling, a sort of Russian babushka doll notion. But this is a different... Um, sort of idea, um, a different sort of idea, um, and Amin's position is, if we look here, an energised network space marked by first the intensification of mixture and connectivity as more and more things become interdependent. Second, the combination of multiple spatialities of organisation and practices, action and belonging at a distance become possible. And I think it's the last one. The erosion of the ontological distinction between place and space as placement in multiple geographies of belonging becomes possible. Do you know, say you sit in your office and talk to someone on email who's in New York, or, or the policy makers do that, and they, um, we interviewed senior policy makers in Australia and asked them who their peers were, and they said they're as likely to speak to someone in this country, in the US, the OECD, um, as they were to talk about to anyone in Australia. There's that, and, and it's that layering in and those different relationships, I think, and it's an interesting way to think about policy. So coming directly to the university, into a system, into a particular politics, um, and, and, and other sets of framings. So the contemporary university, I would argue, in policy terms, is located in these multiple geography spaces within multiple geography spaces of power and policy. And that's interesting to think about policy to practice, I think, um, and, and how we escape that in a way. Um, I mean, I think we're all framed by it, but we still try to do what we want to do. And I think that, that's the interesting bit uh, for me. I, I, I mean, power typology is not so much positioned in space or extended across it, but compose the spaces. I think, I think that's interesting. And the example I had, and I mentioned it the other day, is the PISA test for schools. You know, we've got the main PISA, which measure national system performance. But England, Spain, and the, a state of the US, and Manitoba and Canada in 2012-13 trialled this. Now, it was sponsored by um, a philanthropic trust, given the imprimatur by the OECD, um, 
the analysis of data and the collection of it done by a private agency in the US, CD, CTB McGraw-Hill. And what this does is allow schools in Fairfax County, Virginia in the US to compare their performance with all schools in the US, schools in Shanghai and schools in Mexico. Can you see how th this is a sort of topological relationship? A school in Fairfax County is comparing itself with something in Shanghai, part of the new spatialities. Interesting how universities, I think, are located in, in particular ways. Um, and despite every vice chancellor I've ever spoken to tells me he doesn't give a hoot, she doesn't give a hoot about the rankings. I actually met when I, I shouldn't say this maybe, but I had a meeting once with the Vice Chancellor at Sheffield and he's saying, oh Bob, there's such crap these things. And the next day the Shanghai came out and Sheffield went up 20 points. I looked at the website, 20 places, the only thing on the website, <laughs> the only thing. Um, and <laughs> in my own university, the Leiden ranking of art, social science faculties came out. I'd never heard of it, to be honest. Um, it's all over our university because our faculty was 40th in the world. And on our website, it says, um, one below Johns Hopkins and one above Yale. And clearly, <laughs> we're now a world-class university. You know, this, this, this globalised localism is the push. Um, and I think the interesting thing, though, is the way language and the metrics um, work in relation, um, in relation to that. Got about 10 minutes, Bob. Yeah, thank you. I've been going so fast, I can slow down. <laughs> I was terrified I wouldn't have enough time. <laughs> um, my strategy is always to talk faster rather than have fewer slides, which is a ridiculous strategy, I think. Um, the notion of an emergent global policy field is something I've written about uh, with one of my former uh, doctoral students, where we use Bourdieu, and in his more political work, the late work, um, Acts of Resistance, etc. those books, which in many ways are a little disjunctive um, with the earlier work, I think. Um, it's interesting how he talks about end of the Cold War and the emergence of a global economy. And he talks about, of course, that doesn't come from nowhere. In the way you know, others have written about um, the uh, commodities um, in the economy are constructed as things, that, that they're not commodities. They get constructed as such. And Bourdieu argues you know, the global economy we have was a political act of some group's people to construct it and achieve it. And I would argue similarly with the constitution of a, um, of a, and a global education policy field, using Bourdieu's um, definition. And of course, Bourdieu argued that the social it was, it was his attempt to bring together, I think, Weber, Durkheim and Marx, in a way, and not be one or the other. And, uh, but but it, 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 in, interestingly, I think, with this global field, which I think institutions and systems are located in, and I'll say a little more about that, I think as well there still is a national field, and that set of relationships is interesting as well. But if we take the topological, I think there's some of that global stuff that just goes directly to institutions as well, aren't not mediated by the local and the national, um, and so on. And one of the things we've done recently in an ex post facto analysis, we did 50 interviews with people at the OECD in your department here down in London and with senior policy people in three states and at the national bureaucracy in Australia. And we started to think about their habitus, um, which, 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 which was interesting. But just, just before getting to that, Just before getting to these uh, uh, people that we reflected upon their habitus, I think the constitution of the global field is like uh, what Porter, Desroiseries, Hacking have written about in terms of the creation of national statistical systems of collection, which made nations commensurate uh, for measurement, made them a um, one space. So the measurement of this amount of corn in Lancashire was the same as it was in Devon. And that was a process that took time and so on. Um, and I would argue, like uh, Benedict Anderson argued, that mass literacy was central to the create constitution of the imagined community, which is the nation. I think mass numeracy and commensuration was as equally important and, and hasn't been quite as um, written about as much. And, and so this commensurative work, I think the global field is constructed um, through making 
the globe a commensurate space of measurement. And that's what the Shanghai Jiangtao does. That's what all of those other ranking systems do. I mean, there's a um, Stephen Ball talks in one of his books about an isomorphism of measurement. I'm just wary of that because it seems to hark back to that global world culture argument because I think the isomorphism of measurement is created and constituted by the work of international organisations. So the, 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 the fact you can have PISA or perhaps a HELLO or PIAC from OECD, I mean, they work assiduously um, to get questions which... Uh, uh, that they, they get rid of questions on their pilot surveys, that there's big disparities in performance which reflects cultural difference. They actually make uh, the, the, the globe commensurate for measurement. And I love the way Strathern, uh, there's this lovely quote she has. She says, the global basically is sort of in the habitus of certain people who actually see the globe as one space. Um, which I think is sort of interesting. And so the local is in the global and the global and the national and so on. Now, this piece of research we did, we, and, and we've written about it in that paper, is interesting in terms of the habitus. So we're arguing there's this constitution of the field. But what's interesting at the habitus, we made a distinction between what we call the senior policy makers. Now, these were people, most of whom had PhDs, highly educated, but were in positions of power and authority around policy. And then we uh, talked about the other technical fraction of that new global cosmopolitan middle class, uh, to use Scalia's notion, the policy technicians, the people who created and constituted the test. And what was interesting in terms of some of the arguments uh, I've been outlining to this point, these people actually really disliked the work these people did. These people actually wanted to be... They had a sort of modernist, scientist habitus. Yes, they believed you could make the globe commensurate, but you just ought to leave it to them as the experts. What destroyed everything they did was that they got into the political. And, you know, we found exactly the same... That argument put to us from those people at the OECD, those people in London... And that other place, what's it, is it Slough or something like that? It's where the National Foundation for Education... Do you say Slough? It always seems such a strange word to me. I was going to say sloth. That's what I thought. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, and in Australia, at state and national levels. Um, so, so in a way, these people were bearers of a particular modernity and there might be something of that, the Mayer argument there. But with these people that they had to play the politics and sell this and work it. And, um, and I think it's the, 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 the power thing, etc., cetera, which came, uh, came, to play, uh, came to play there. Oh, and that, they were just the people that we dealt... where we'd interviewed people and where they fitted and so on. Um, but it was the notion of a habitus to a field, I think. And it was extraordinary to us how when we ask questions of, say, the technicians, whether they were in Paris, two places in England, or four places in Australia, when we'd say, oh, there's problems with this, they'd say, yes, but adaptive testing, the new technology, fast feedback, we've got all the solutions if the politicians would just leave us alone. And there was this absolute confident commitment, um, you know, that there, there was this commensurate space, and how... How does it play? And I mean, I think that's interesting to think about in terms of policy. Got a couple of minutes. Yep. And, um, I think I've got two more slides, so that's good. Um, the, the last way to think about policy is the notion of network governance. The argument that at the state level, we've got a new uh, form and modality of the state, that we've gone from the new public management to network governance and what uh, Ball and Juneman call heterarchical governance. That is a mixture of the hierarchical, rescaled, and the networked. Um, that is, um, like I've been doing work on Pearson in the United States, and one sees over the last 10 years, for example, Pearson have expended 8 million US on trying to influence politicians. Pearson have, in their current business strategy, number one strategy to frame global education policy agendas. Um, and, and they get more access. Um, in Queensland, where I lived, the previous government 
had uh, all the power players, all the stakeholders in education for two days, and they had one thing to read, and it was Pearson's learning curve. Not academic research, not... I mean, it shocked me. And, and this is part of... It's, it's this. In the world of network governance, and it's not only within the nation, but it's stretched regionally and globally, and it's actors other than the state. It's businesses, edgy businesses, it's philanthropic groups, it's... Um, civil society groups and so on. And we must think back to that definition of uh, de Souza Santos as well, of course, that there's multiple globalizations from above and below contested the globalized localisms and so on. So in the world of network governance, government is understood to be located alongside business and civil society actors in a complex game of public policy formation, decision making and implementation. A, a university in Australia that I'm trying to find out more about um, their MBA program has been constructed by Pearson. Uh, the curriculum, the, um, now, I know that because the inside academics have told me it's not advertised, it's advertised as the universities, and I think some of that's happening in South Africa, as I understand it, Jenny, um, as well, and certainly in education. Um, teachers in Australia daily get emails to go to the Pearson Academy uh, for professional development. There's this business interest, they're in there, but they're also, if you go to the OECD, uh, they paid for, um, a CD, a document on what you could learn from the best reformers uh, in schooling systems and so on. And so it, it, there's a sort of quasi-privatisation of the education policy community, different in different places, um, and I think who has access to what um, and so on um, is interesting. And it is that question, has the authority of the state diminished? I, I don't know. I think it just works differently. But there's multiple players, and how does that affect policy? And there's these multiple spaces that the university is located in. OK, to come to a close, like I think it's how we define and conceptualise policy. Is it discourse? Is it text, processes, practices, implementation, enactment? carries, implementa uh, carries uh, implications for how we understand, theorise and research policy enactment into practice. And I always wonder how, how this gets into, in a way, say, when we're teaching a class or whatever, and does some of that escape some of this, the core of what the university is? Does that still happen in schools? I don't know. You, could, you, can, you can think about that. We need to think of policy as in those multiple ways. We need to think of policy makers, actors, agents, and the various organisations. But I think located universities and higher ed systems. And I think it's in some places you can talk of a higher education system, I think. I mean, which is, I think in the move to mass or universal higher ed, I think there's been new sorts of differentiation that has occurred. And that, that's certainly occurring within Australian higher ed in quite a substantial way. So that the universities are situated um, locally, nationally, globally in multiple spaces of power and policy with the seeming overcoming of that ontological distinction between place and space. So we, um, and I think we have to go beyond a methodological nationalism to think about this. And I think where I'm located at the University of Queensland, it always struck me when I lived in the UK, the sort of absolute focus in policy in Australia, about Australia and Asia, like it's here in this country, but not in the way it is in Australia. Um, and our doctoral students tend to come from that part of the world, and our doctoral students, some, not all, are forever you know, questioning, was this what they paid to do, to come here to learn Western knowledges, to apply back there as simply an empirical site, or is there something else that should be going on? Uh, in conversations, you know, Padurai talks about a, a strong definition of internationalisation, which is that what we do and southern theory and all of that set of questions, deparochialising our knowledge as part of moves beyond methodological nationalism. That, you know, I used to think it as a young person, as a sociology student, undergraduate, I actually used to ask these academics, most of whom were American, do you think one day, sometime in the future, someone might be sitting here and hearing about Australian sociology? It was beyond 
the comprehension that theory came from somewhere else and all I could ever do, I used to say, so I will spend the rest of my existence applying theories from the metropoles of the global north to me and all I am is an empirical site. And um, there's some really interesting work about that and I think it fits into what I've been trying to say about policy, universities and higher ed systems. And there's a lovely book that Jane Kenway and her colleagues have taken that Chen book which Asia as Method, I don't know whether you know it, and they've just produced a, um, an edited collection uh, called Asia as Method um, in educational research. But that, that opens up some of the things in relation to this positioning in these multiple spaces. So thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Bob, for such a thought-provoking and disquieting presentation in lots of ways. So we've got some time for some questions or comments. Who would like to start us off? Silence, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Paul. <laughs> now, I'm an immature man. <laughs> Mine's just quite a practical yeah. question. I yeah. thought that was a fascinating presentation. There's so yeah. much in there that I want to go off and read. But in terms of the trying to achieve what you just talked about at the end, um, mm. more of a shared purpose and, and um, yeah. international collaboration in people like yourselves trying to yeah. influence policy, do you see places where this can happen? Or, yeah. or there, do you see gaps where, you know, yeah. what do you think might help to enable that sort of avoiding that sort of Western, no, no, Western yeah. view. Uh, look, I think there. Are, I think universities are, are still spaces where thinking of particular sorts can go on. I always remember reading one of the last pieces that Edward Said read. He says, like, we all owe oh, woe as us in universities, and it was so much better. That, but we're still in very privileged space and position, and it is the a space left where you can open up all of these things for discussion. So I think. There's still something positive about that, despite all of the things. That was the point I was trying to, to pick up. I mean, I, I think in terms of our own intellectual research interests and so on, and working with students and so on, I mean, I think you, you, you can try to escape um, some of this, in a way. But the other side, I think, is it's the um, Boa Ventura de Sousa Santos argument that there's multiple globalizations, and for the last couple of years, I have been a critical friend, and there's about 30 or 40 of us around the world to um, EI, Education International, which is the International Federation of Teachers Unions. And I go to these meetings in Brussels, and I come away absolutely enlivened, because they bring in all these international civil society groups, Action Aid, um, da da da, they go on. I get emails every day, and there's a meeting tomorrow um, in Vienna of all these who are, uh, are trying to work against some of the, particularly the edgy business thing they're trying to work against. So I think it's not a politics of one. I think, it, do you know what I mean? I don't, and, and I think sometimes this sort of analysis can give that account. And I, I wasn't, you know, I think, I don't know. I think it is a fairly awful moment. I always <laughs> was saying in Australia in my long life so far um, that it was a fairly bad political moment. But, you know, I think there's still uh, some spaces and there's still... Uh, and I think there's a danger in doing research and presenting it as if it is all... <laughs> but it's not to say we, you know, we should take a critical approach to that, I think. Mark? Just to follow on from that, can you... The league tables are fascinating, aren't yeah. they? Because they're, they're kind of a marathon yeah. race that everybody joins, even yeah. if they're... Yeah. pole vaulters or yeah. sprinters or whatever. Yeah. Can, can you think of any examples where people have successfully refused to join yes. the race? James Cook University in Australia um, has Sandra Harding, her name is. Uh, she's the Vice-Chancellor. It's up there in Townsville on the Barrier Reef. It's marine biology stuff is some of the very, very best in the world. And she says that, like... So she says, I won't participate in these. They're nonsense. Like, I know we've got the best marine biology in the world, but when you aggregate everything together, we come 784th. What's it mean? It's useless. It's pathetic. It's stupid. So she withdrew, and she had a big piece in the paper about why she would no longer participate. Interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, you mentioned David Harvey yeah. um, in his book, yeah. Enigma of Capital. Yeah. He basically argues that 
this we're powerless. Yeah. Kind of, and I just wondered yeah. how how yeah. you've accounted for that in your kind of definition of globalization yeah. and, and power. Yeah. I think it is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll all slit our wrists and go home. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I always want to keep open some sort of open space. And the fact that David Harvey can write those books and we can all read them and try to understand, it, there must be something that's... Do you know? Like, um, I, 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 I don't know. And... and I think there are political shocks every now and then of a good kind as well as of a bad kind. Um, you know, and we've had a couple in Australia quite recently which have been interesting to me. Um, and in a way, I think my sense is a lot of the official doesn't touch the real lives of real people. Do you know? So there's something, don't you think? It's like... All right, probably it's time for yeah. final well, comment. Yeah, well, it was very much picking up that point, yeah. you know, the, the notion of oppositional or emerging cultures. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I know what you mean about being pessimistic, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, within your yeah. talk was this, this, this notion of sort of uh, localised glo globalisation, yeah. situated nature yeah. of adapted behaviour. Yeah. 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 And you can do stuff of, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A whole range of, yeah. well, I suppose you could call it a sort of optimistic view of people, yeah. um, that uh, no matter how hard uh, sort of technicist and, and, and globalised yeah. uh, processes of this kind take place, there, there is an impulse uh, which is highly situated, which is highly oppositional quite often, yeah. and then over time uh, becomes a, 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 new, a new dominance. And this notion of an enclave of oppositional behaviour, I think is really quite a, yeah. a good antidote. Yeah, and I wonder where social media and all that plays. Absolutely. I really do, because I think there is another world from, you know, if you looked at the media in Australia, you'd slit your wrist every day. The, the newspapers, I mean. But there's something else out there which isn't that, and I think it's almost as if that's becoming nowhere near as significant as it, as it was. So, yeah, I, I think you're right, Murray. Yeah. You have to be. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. can we thank Bob again for yeah. such stimulation? Thank you. Thank you.